I need you to know that here at True Crime and Headlines, we call you our true crime besties, not as a gimmicky, cheesy tagline, although it might be, but as our genuine friends, sisters, and fellow truth seekers. The world can feel like a big, lonely place, and we want to give you a space to feel seen in your interests, heard in your curiosities, and make you feel like you're sitting with your friends discussing things that are bigger than us. You are wanted. You're loved and your butt looks great. And Joe, are we ready? Let's do it. Let's dive back into part two of episode 12. And we're ready if you are, guys. This is an ongoing case of Long Island serial killer, and you're with your bestie host, Jules and Joe. Let's go. If you've not listened to part one of episode 12 yet, you'll want to go back and do so before rejoining us here for part two. Now, we left you in part one, having learned that Shannon Gilbert, a young 23-year-old woman diagnosed with bipolar and feeling a little lost in life, was working as an escort. She went missing in 2010, only to be found a year and a half later, her cause of death undetermined by the medical examiner. The police would later go on record saying... They do not suspect foul play in her death, but rather she drowned in the marshy reed or succumbed to the elements while likely in a psychosis state or on drugs. And Jody, you said that smells like baloney. <laughs> yeah, no, she didn't sound like she was in a manic episode and she possibly was under the influence, but I don't think that's what was the cause of death. While authorities were searching for Shannon, four bodies of four missing women were who were also sex escorts via Craigslist, were found within one mile of each other. And sadly, more bodies would be found soon after in 2011, solidifying fears of a local serial killer in the small Suffolk County of Long Island, New York. We are going to dive into the victims and what ties them together as being connected to one killer. Let's start with the first discovered victims of who we are now referring to as the Gilgo Four. The original first four remains of women, which were discovered during the search for Shannon. The four victims were discovered in December of 2010. So why just these four? Weren't there others discovered later? Yes. And the others discovered later were thought to have predated, the remains predated the Gilgo Four. But we are focusing on the four that are named in the case against the man who was arrested as of July 2023 for the Gilgo Four. And that's why we're focusing on these four. Rex Hureman. So we, before we take you down this hole, we need to look into how exactly were these four girls' remains discovered. It was because there was a massive search conducted for Shannon Gilbert immediately after her driver, Michael Peck, reported her missing. False. <laughs> He never reported her missing. Michael Pack got in his car and drove home without Shannon and never reported her missing. There was never a big search conducted. I mean, he was investigated. So where did he say she went? She was gone. (laughs) He doesn't know. He went without her. He did pass a lie detector test. So do with that as you will. But it could be possible he's just a shithead. A rotten human out for self-preservation. Yeah, yeah. He's a guy paid to drive a girl to a man's house who found a sex worker off Craigslist. So, yeah, I'm not sure it's a stretch of the imagination to imagine that he's, like, a horrible man and why he yeah. wouldn't call the authorities. There's yeah. Like, you know, we can ascertain there are drugs, illegal sexual activities going on. So then it was because, all right— A massive search was started after Shannon's family filed a missing persons report, and then they connected the dots with the three 911 calls that evening. Again, no, this did not happen either. The connection wasn't even made for months because the 911 calls were transferred to a different district when Shannon couldn't name her location as Suffolk County. So then what? How did these bodies get discovered? Get this. Because of a canine training operation. Oh, no way. One 
Suffolk County K-9 officer, a man named John Malia, was with his K-9 dog, and they were doing a missing person search training session. Now, recall, this is December of 2011. Shannon was missing May of 2010. So there is a significant amount of time where Shannon was not searched for by police. So don't forget that. If you're wondering if police corruption had anything to do with it, you may be on the right path because it did. And we'll go into that in a little bit. During this search, the dog finds two bodies. Just a few days later, they find two more, all within a mile of each other, all females, all wrapped in the same burlap material. According to an article by Times Reporter, Berga, on August 2nd, 2023, titled Gilgo Beach Murder Suspects Appear in Court. Here's what we know about the case. Quote, police connected the cases because the Gilgo Four were found wrapped in burlap and bound around their ankles. All of the women were in their 20s, worked as sex workers, and were out meeting a client when they disappeared, according to the Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Site, end quote. And sadly, given all the news coverage over the findings of these bodies and the lack of awareness about Shannon's disappearance, Shannon Gilbert was not one of the four that was discovered at this time. But recall we shared in part one, she was discovered a few months later. And the four women's remains were identified through DNA testing of their remains. And they all had something in common. They were all very, very petite. Huh, that's really interesting. Tell me more. Because Shannon was so little. Yes. And they referred to her on the 911 call. Mr. Coletti referred to her as... 14. Um, Do we know who hired these women when they went missing? Yeah, we'll go into that. (sighs) (laughs) They were all very petite women in their 20s, and they were all sex workers. But there's something else. They also all found potential clients through Craigslist ads. And if you're like me, like a bell went off because we can possibly trace search history if we have devices used with technology today, websites visited, urgency is key. But it appears that this was not a priority for Suffolk County because although these bodies were found in 2010, it's not until 2022 that a new task force team is formed. And kudos to them because this team ends up working tirelessly to trace the leads, rebuild the case, find their suspect, and build their evidence strong enough to make an arrest and charge their suspect with three counts of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree murder. And if you're wondering why not four, because the Gil go four, it's because he remains a suspect in the fourth and they're still actively building the case against him for the fourth victim found. What about the others that were found, the other batch? He is not currently tied to them. So I am led to believe that because they feel so strongly that they can tie him to definitely three of the women, they're going to go forth because now they have a serial killer. And if they can tie him to those, here we go. And how old is this man? uh, 49, 59. Okay. And did it say like when they suspected that the, the bodies were deceased? I'll go into that. (sighs) Julie. (laughs) How did all these women get to this small part of Gilgo Beach in this area of Long Island, New York, just off this gated community? Well, it's not a very heavily populated area, Joe. And these women were from all other parts of New York, like Shannon, who also drove out to this specific area to meet the same clients, we can assume. And was it the same ill fate? So let's take a look. Marine Brenard Barnes, Caucasian brunette with sparkly eyes, was just 25 years old when on July 9, 2007, she disappeared. ABC7 News reports that Marine was driving from her home in Connecticut to Long Island to meet with potential clients. And she often did this and stayed at a motel for a few days, and then she would go home with the money that she received from services. While she goes missing, she never gets home. Gilgonews.com reports that, quote, although she was known to work out of motel rooms on the night of July 9, 2007, she told her friend she would be going to meet outside 
of the motel on an out call, and she was never seen again. Now, she did make a call to a friend around 11 p.m. on July 9, and that was the last known contact. She was also traveling with a friend who was also a sex worker, but the friend reportedly went home early. And it's July 14th, just five days later, when Maureen's friend files a missing persons report. So Maureen was also just four foot 11. She's very petite. She's only 105 pounds. It's important to remember that we say remains when discussing what was left behind a Maureen's physical body. And it's always felt a bit, I don't know, it's felt disconnected to me, Joe, to say her remains. I, I don't know. I just, in all of my true crime consumption, it always felt disconnected to hear the words remains were found. And why didn't we find Marine? Mm-hmm. And I think I understand it a little bit more after doing our own true crime podcast. The more true crime stories we cover, the more I understand why it's used. I think it helps to separate the life from the crime as well as being able to honor Marine's life as a person versus what was left behind and taken from her. Sure. A U.S. Sun article I came across shares that Marine's remains may have held a massive key to closing in on a suspect. Listen to this. A leather belt was found bound around Marine's body. This belt was customized. It had engraved initials in the leather. The initials were W.H., which, coincidentally, our suspect, Rex Hewerman, has a grandfather named William Hewerman, W-H. The article goes on to quote the Suffolk County District Attorney, quote, there was a hair that is still being tested that was removed by the buckle of the belt, end quote. Hello, DNA evidence, anyone? Woo! Now we're talking. But we're talking about the suspect without telling you how we even got Rex. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm aware of that. So just stay with me here. So let's slow our roll a little bit because in real time, at this time of finding these women, there's not a suspect. We have Marines Mermaids discovered three years after she goes missing. And Marine okay. was a woman with a life, a past, a future stolen for her. If you're a regular around True Crime and Headlines then you'll know Joe and I don't victim shame. We never victim shame. And I know many people feel brave behind keyboards and will say horrific things about victims, but that's not us. If that's you, bye. (laughs) Behind this woman, Maureen, didn't deserve to die. Whether our victims are strung out on crack or sex workers or whatever may be the case, like we've talked about in previous cases before. Don't matter. It don't matter. Maureen is a missed daughter, sister, and mother. In fact, she was more than one of the Gilgo Four. She was a mother who left behind a very young daughter named Nicolette. Now, fast forward from 2000 to 2010. June of 2010, we have the next woman's remains discovered. And that is 22-year-old Megan Waterman from Maine. And she is also a sex escort who also found clients through Craigslist. Megan was also a young mother. She left behind a three-year-old daughter named Liliana. Oh, goodness. She was last seen at a hotel in New York. And Megan's grandmother, who actually raised Megan. Megan had a bit of a rough start to life and upbringing with her parents. And she was taken in along with her brother by her grandmother. She was last seen at a hotel in New York. And her, her grandmother goes on to tell Murder She Told website, Quote, saying, her vivacious nature, she was just so much fun to be with and be around. It was like she just sparkled. She is very strong-willed, and you always knew where you stood with Megan. She never went behind your back. I think that's why she had so many friends and why so many people cared about her, because they knew exactly where she stood. End quote. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like you, Joe. (laughs) Oh, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. (sighs) Megan was last seen walking away from the hotel where she was staying with her boyfriend, a man named Akeem who was later convicted on drug trafficking charges. But Akeem was not with her when she left the hotel. According to Akeem, Megan left without telling him specifics, and it's alleged that she took on another job, quote, another John, a.k.a. sex client, and was walking to meet him outside of the hotel. Megan's family had filed a missing persons report as well fairly soon after Megan disappeared. Now, just one month later, on July 12, 2010, Melissa 
Bartholomew, a 24-year-old Caucasian woman from the Bronx, goes missing. Golly. From her home after she tells a friend she is headed out to meet a client. She is also a sex worker. And listen to this, Joe. An article from the Buffalo News titled, quote, Mother of Missing Buffalo Woman Helped Kickstart Investigation of Serial Killer, quote, says that In the summer of 2009, a 15-year-old Buffalo girl received disturbing phone calls from a man who taunted her about her missing sister. What made the calls especially scary was that the caller was using the cell phone owned by the missing woman, Melissa M. Bartholomew, 24. At one point, according to the police, the caller bragged that he had sexually assaulted Bartholomew and killed her. Today, those calls to Amanda Funderburg and other members of her Buffalo family are cited as important evidence in the murder case against accused serial killer Rex A. Huberman, a Manhattan architect and Long Island resident, end quote. What an idiot. Why would he call a family member of somebody he killed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes you, no sense. Well, you heard that right. You know, the victim's family is looking for Melissa. They see on their cell phone, caller ID pops up. It says Melissa's calling them. What a mind trip that must be. Answer the phone because Melissa's been missing. Finally, she's calling us. Can you imagine what kind of turmoil that would put a family into? Just talk about a roller coaster of emotion and and the trauma. They see Melissa calling them. They're frantically trying to find her. And they answer the phone. And who's on the other line? Some monster taunting and teasing them about assaulting and killing their daughter, their sister. Golly. One more commonality which ties the four women together, aside from being petite and all working as escorts, is none of their cases seem to have been taken seriously or urgently by law enforcement at this time. Because they're sex workers, right? Yes. In fact, the same article goes on to back this up by reporting, quote, Attorney Stephen M. Cohen, who represented the Bartholomew family, told the news in 2011 that New York City police had a policy at the time of not investigating missing persons for 10 days, and that because Bartholomew worked as a hooker, detectives would not be assigned to the case, end quote. That's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, when you think about ah, the people that go into sex work, often they are some of the most vulnerable in our population. There's often a life of trauma before that and difficult things, survival, essentially, that brings them to this life. And so, the fact that we're going to completely dismiss them and treat them like garbage. You just dispose of them and not even investigate. Like, what a way to validate my entire life that I am I am nothing. Exactly. That is horrifically, I can't even, that's so sad. I feel like there is a narrative that so many nonprofits out there are trying to share that most sex workers are victims in sex trafficking and trying to change the narrative in the eyes of the public to get these women and men help that they desperately need to be taken out of this in which they have been propelled into. Yeah. Here's the bigger question, and we've touched on this in multiple cases we've covered so far. You know, I talked about Matthew Weaver Jr. and as recent as missing Kay Alana Turner in Texas— why, and you just touched on this, why would sex workers be valued any less if they're missing? In my opinion, a missing person is a missing person. Are they missing? Yes. Okay. Let's find them. And again, incredibly vulnerable population, right? Little support, isolated, little money and financial resources, often young families at home that they're trying to survive and provide for. Like, these people are incredibly vulnerable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's let's do a flow chart, shall we, everybody? <laughs> Start at the top. Are they missing? Yes. Go down. Okay, let's find them. There, I did it. It's not, are they missing? Yes. Are they a prostitute? Yes. Go down. Okay, let's wait six months, maybe, if we're not busy. No. I just fixed that chart for you, everybody. Here we go. I am sure people out there somewhere will validate the police force's decision to not act with swiftness in these cases, but that may be because they're saying someone's life isn't as important to save. Those are not our people. Bye. Save first. Figure out consequences 
later. Ethics in law enforcement have to stop having caveats. It's their responsibility to take a missing persons report and act upon it. Now, a person of sound mind most likely made the missing person reports. Somebody that loves someone yep. missing. They're begging for help. I'm sorry. In a day and age where you can track us wherever we are with our cell phones, you can track our conversations where we have this illusion of privacy that's really not there. You can track us on corner streets like. Joe's got her tinfoil hat Here on. we go. My conspiracy is coming out. <laughs> truly, truly. It's an illusion of of privacy at this point. Like you buy a, a drone at Walmart. It is on somebody's desk. Your footage is on somebody's desk by the following Monday. It is insane. But we can't find people to go missing because we don't give a shit. We can. We can. There are and more that's important what you're things. We don't we, give a shit. We can. They did not. They did not. I have to mark this episode explicit. <laughs> Jody said shit for the first time in her life. <laughs> That's a bold face lie. <laughs> Three months later, on September 2nd, 2010, our final Gilgo Beach victim goes missing. This time, it's 27 year old Amber Lynn Costello, who was also a sex worker or escort and was going to meet a potential client as well. Amber was from New York. However, something stands out a little different about Amber, and it's that Amber was never reported missing. Unlike the other three women who had family report them missing, nobody reported Amber missing. What a lonely place to be. Yeah. Not one person in this world gives a shit that you're gone. And and that's a hard pill to swallow, and it could be that cutting toxicity out of your life or maybe not following her path because that would be enabling her. You don't. We don't know the path she took to get to— Yeah, but you cannot support somebody and also m- report that they're missing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree, and it gets worse because she lived in a house with four people. Do you want to take a guess about this house? Yeah, Tell me. Okay. I don't want to be judgmental. (laughs) Everyone else is like, where are you with you? And and I set it up. I walked you through that door because she was not reported missing by any of her housemates. So let's go into that. Three other roommates, all sadly, all residents of this home, along with Amber, were addicted to heroin. And it's alleged by the Gilgo News website that Amber was working as an escort And she was finding clients off Craigslist as a way to support her and her roommate's heroin addiction. She's originally from North Carolina, and it did break my heart, Joe, to see that she had moved to New York initially to complete a rehabilitation program. Actually, and this was fairly recently from when she went missing. And she very recently had relapsed, and then she went missing. And... Golly. I know. It's one of the hardest parts being in the mental health field is that you can't do the work for somebody. They've got to want it themselves. That is so hard. It's the hardest part. Would you say you're an empath? Yeah. I don't would would you say that most mental health providers are empaths? Yeah, I would say a lot of us are. Yeah, that's gotta be hard not to take that home with you. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Which is why I put it in my suitcase and take it home every day. But you know, Julie, like, like I am very, I think I hadn't thought about this before, but I am very, I have very strong boundaries. Like even with, with recording, I will not record on the weekend because the weekend is a time with my family. And yes. so I think, I think that it, it has forced me in hindsight into like creating very rigid, strong, specific boundaries mm-hmm. because this is the stuff that we do every day, all day. Yeah. How could you not if you didn't have clear, rigid boundaries? Yeah, I, I do want to honor that because you you have really good boundaries. And I hate that you have boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be one. <laughs> we are most days. <laughs> An eyewitness report in the police reports from 2010 is stated same, they saw a first-generation Chevy Avalanche truck in the vicinity where she was last seen. Her remains were found just four months later. Okay, so she never goes missing. Four months later, her roommates are interviewed, 
and they say, oh, I remember this Chevy Avalanche track. I don't know if it was a roommate that was interviewed. It was just stated as an eyewitness per what I was able to see in that the That seems really strange to me. Like, I haven't seen someone in four months, but I'm going to remember this Chevy Avalanche. I mean, it's possible. It just seems you weird. Know, behaviors are unpredictable. Yeah. They're on heroin. They're struggling day to day themselves. There's no consistency yeah. or co- consistency or communication. So it does make sense that, you know, a heroin, a woman struggling with heroin addiction and also fighting through working with sex work, living with other heroin addicts and other sex workers, you know, you can't rely on anybody. <laughs> Nothing's consistent. So... She was last seen walking out of her home by foot to allegedly meet a client outside her home. Now, it's time to circle back to the corruption of Suffolk police at the time of 2009 when Shannon Gilbert's disappearance first occurred, which then spawned the discovery of the four women's remains when a police officer was doing a canine search training session along the area where Shannon purposely went missing. Well, was purposely searching around the area where Shannon went missing. And it's now 2023. And an arrest was just made by a task force put together in 2022. So what the hell happened between 2009 and 2022? Well, let's talk about what didn't happen. It's not good, Joe. It's really, it's not good. It's not good. (laughs) And it's heartbreaking to know that what I know now in this case kills a reputation of good cops out there who are fighting and trying to fight the good fight. So here's what you need to know. The police chief of Suffolk County in 2009 was a man named James Burke. He is no longer the police chief of Suffolk County. And what if I told you that former Suffolk County police chief, James Burke, was not cooperative with the FBI starting in 2009 during this time? And he was accused by many to have purposely stalled the Gilgo Beach murder investigations. James Burke was not fired from his job as police chief. He retired, quote, resigned, quote, retired. And then he was found guilty of obstruction of justice and revenge beating. Here's the breakdown of what led to this chief's disgrace after he, quote, retired. He basically beat someone up who stole items from his work-issued vehicle and unlawfully entered this said suspect's home and demanded that multiple officers in his police department cover this up. He did not have permission or a warrant to enter this man's home to search for the things that were taken from his police car. This is the chief, the freaking chief yeah, of police. Named it like a bad apple. There's there are bad in every profession. Yes, police, doctors, teachers. It doesn't matter. Oh my there gosh. are bad apples in every profession. Can confirm. Can yeah. confirm. But that doesn't make the whole bad. Exactly. I hated, hated when we had horrible teachers who did not care. And then the kids would get to my class. Well, so-and-so doesn't care. I'm like, that's that's their life choice. We have a different choice. Let's go on a different route. I wouldn't even sugarcoat it with them. I know. We don't do anything. They don't care. I know. It makes my job harder. But here we are. Mm-hmm. And I care. So let's go. <laughs> Very aware of that. Thanks. I wonder if he's connected to Rex in any way. Yeah, and what were those items? Well, according to Ashley Flowers from the podcast Crime Junkie, she does address this during her coverage of this case as well on her episode of the Long Island Serial Killer. And she says that there are some reports that claim there was a snuff video which contained a sex worker in the video. And many people speculate that this could be why the deaths of the Gilgo Four were not investigated the way they deserve to be. Could the investigation have uncovered police department abuse way before the 2015 charges against the chief over these actions? These are unsubstantiated claims. They're just rumors that were going around the mill, but it is reported in many avenues and speculated on many forums enough that we had to address it. What else was going on? So forget forget the rumors on the snuff video. Just the cover-up of running some good old boys cop sting alone is absolutely questionable, embarrassing, shameful. And even more so, Joe, the district attorney's office, who is responsible for pressing charges, this police chief started his career as an investigator for 
the district attorney's office. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Absolutely unfortunate. And I'll have you know that over 11 officers in the Suffolk County Police Department testified against the chief to the corruption they witnessed firsthand. Kudos to them. Good. And it gets weirder. Just a year later in 2016, so a year after he is found guilty of obstruction of justice and the revenge beating, Shannon Gilbert's mother, remember, she was the one who relentlessly searched for her daughter. and She's the one credited with even finding out that there is a serial killer out there. <sighs> she is murdered. Her mom was? Correct. She stabbed to death. And that that puts it mildly. And this what? is this is the gruesome truth. Shannon's mother, Mari, was savagely murdered. In a 2023 article by CNN, reporter Ray Sanchez writes, quote, on July 23rd, 2016, tragedy again befell the family. Mari Gilbert was 52 when she was stabbed hundreds of times what? with a 15-inch kitchen knife. By who? By her other daughter, Sarah. She was then bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher, according to a court document. Sarah Gilbert who Ray said suffered both emotionally and mentally after her sister's death, was sentenced to a prison term of 25 years to life. And okay, so now I'm now my ears are, are perked up, and I'm a little bit more convinced of the bipolar diagnosis, given her sister's behaviors, because a lot of this can be kind of genetic. I have to know more about the sister. I know that Shannon was in and out of the foster system as well. There's a long trail of trauma that follows this family as well. And now you could argue there are three victims of the Gilbert family. Oh, goodness gracious. I could. Oh, my goodness. Five years later, after the murder of Shannon's mom by her sister, Sarah, five years later in 2021, a new Suffolk County police commissioner comes on the scene. His name is Rodney Harrison. What's up, Rodney? I think you're awesome. Here we go. It takes him only one year on the job to see how dangerous his county is each passing day without finding a potential serial killer. And it's then in 2022 that he puts together a task force for the Gilgo Beach murder victim cases. Finally! Thank you! And this time, the Fed... Sorry if I just blew your ears out, guys. <laughs> and this time, the federal... I can never say this, Bureau. Say it. Bureau. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is asked to join in on the team, something they were not asked to previously do in all those years that they should have been asked to join in. I'm wondering if it's because what would the FBI have discovered along the way? And with this task force consisting of FBI agents, county detectives, state investigators, they all work together around the clock with precision and focus because just one year later, Joe, in 2023... They announce that they have made an arrest. The Long Island serial killer suspect has been charged with the murder of three of the four Gilgo victims. And he remains a suspect as in the fourth victim's murder. I and, wonder what they're looking for, what they need to tie him to that. Well, in part three, I'm going to take you into the story of the Long Island serial killer suspect, Rex Hewerman, how he was tracked down and charged, his family life. Would you be surprised to know he was considered a family man? No, I feel like that's always the case. Is he connected at all to uh, Michael Pack and the other one? No, ma'am. Hmm. He's not connected. However, his burner phones are, his search histories are, his activity is connected. It is huh. the evidence against him is damning and we are going to go deep into it into their case now he still hasn't gone to trial and i will tell you he has pled not guilty definitely not guilty absolutely not guilty innocent absolutely innocent um you know what joe what? <laughs> this guy's a piece of shit <laughs> yeah clearly <laughs> Um, thank you for being here in part two. Please come back part three because we need to dive into the psyche of this monster. And we we do have to 
be ethical and true crime reporting and say that he is a suspect and he is not proven guilty in a court of law yet. Hmm. But we'll let you decide in the court of podcast <laughs> what you think in part three. Come back for us. We love you. Your butt looks great, Joe. Will you tell, tell me your words of wisdom? I always put her on the spot and she stalls. Uh. <laughs> Excellent. We'll see you back. <laughs> we love you guys. Bye. And Lee. I'll see. My mama is a podcaster. Bye, too.